same way. Appreciate some of the things that are different from the way things have been in the past. Amen. <clears throat> so what uh, I think I told you this last time I filled in for Josh that uh, I've been I haven't been I haven't been as diligent about this as I was hoping to be because I only have about three more of these that I've done. In fact, I know I did some on chapters three and four, but I can't figure out. I didn't have my notebook when I did them. And so I wrote them on another piece of paper and I can't find that piece of paper because I'm trying to put them in my notebook as a place to collect these. But <clears throat> but what we're doing is um, we're looking at uh, we're going to be in Psalm five. That's where we're going to be. What I've been doing uh, to uh, <clears throat> just try to keep me um, <clears throat> a little bit brushed up and not quite so stale when it comes to my Hebrew. Um, <clears throat> I've been looking at, um, been reading through one of these Psalms and I take two or three days working on this and I read through it in Hebrew and then looking at it with the English. But then um, one of the things I'm doing is I'm looking at what, what did David appreciate about what God's doing? What was David looking for? But then also trying to think, what are some things that are contrasts? Because uh, not everything that David is going to ask for or think are going to be, they're not all going to fit our situation today, okay? And sometimes we come to the book of the Psalms and we have such reverence for the Psalms that we don't exercise discernment to say, that's not us. That's a different situation. And I think we need to do both. We can appreciate what's similar, but we also need to appreciate what's different. So I'm going to go ahead and read. I'm reading from the uh, New King James because that's the English in the margin of my Hebrew Bible. And I'm going to read through that and you follow along in your Bible and then we'll kind of walk back through this. As we're doing this, of course, I want you mostly to be just following along, but I also want you to think about, oh, that's actually maybe a good thing for me to think about, but also think about, oh, that's something that's different. And uh, as we walk back through this. So verse one, to the chief musician with flutes, a Psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation, give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, <clears throat> for to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of perversity, and you destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into your house uh, in the multitude of, of your loving kindness. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. There is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. One of the first things that starts off in this, in this uh, uh, psalm after he tells us, because this is this was something that they played. You can see at the beginning there, the introduction with flutes. And then this psalm or this song of praise uh, from David. He says, give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my, my meditation. And I think last time uh, we were together, we talked a little bit about the idea of meditating on Scripture. And this particular uh, word that he uses here is the word Hagah in Hebrew. And it's it's uh, a word used for the moaning of doves. We have doves around here. We're back in Iowa. You get to hear the beautiful morning doves. I always thought that were doves that moaned in the morning. I didn't understand that they were morning doves. <laughs> are you in there? Oh, what? Yeah, you are. I didn't I get that. I always thought, I don't, why do they call them morning doves? I was a dumb kid. Anyway, but you hear that. And then you come out here and we have these doves. And they're a little bit like the morning doves. But as my wife calls them, psycho doves. Because they're like, wah, wah, wah. you know, they make this other noise. that's really annoying. Uh <laughs> 
And uh, they're not even native doves to this area. They actually are doves that have infiltrated the ranks. Anyway, but this word is used for that. It's used for that morning sound that they make. It's used of lions that are sitting in the night and doing that. You ever heard that when you, uh, Peg and I watched a show years ago called Sir. <laughs> we watched a, a guy called Survivor Man. He'd go out in the wilderness with a bunch of cameras. And there was one time when he was supposed to be pretending like he was in a plane crash in Africa. And you, he's he's got a thing up in the tree. And it's making him nervous at night because he can hear these lions around there. Mm, mm, not roaring, just doing that low moaning sound. That's the sound. That's the noise or the word that he uses here. And it's that word meditation has the idea of you're repeating, you're saying something again and again. So, so um, David is saying, I know that I have to repeat. I, I need to know the law. So I'm going to repeat this, this, this law again and again. I'm going to rattle this, this law off. Um, when I teach people biblical Greek, one of the things I teach them is that you learn Greek endings. You, you memorize those in packets. So you, you want a present active indicative. You go, oh, ice, I, amanete, usi. You repeat that. And you do it over and over until it's like it just stuck in your head. Oh, ice, I, amanete, usi. My a time, metha, es, non time. You repeat this over and over so that you can sit and you come across the word and you rattle through all those. those and it takes you to the place where you're supposed to be. And go, oh, that's what this one is. That one is over here. And it's that's the way I learned it. But it's the same thing. David's saying that this is what I do, is that I repeat these things over and over because I need to remember them. And they translate it meditation, makes it sound very, what comes to mind when you think of meditation? <laughs> oh, yeah, Peggy, sick it off, yeah. What were you saying, Leslie? Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, and there are a lot of cultures that do that. I think a lot of Christians think it's like, I read the passage and then I just sit and think, Hmm. ruminate on what does that mean well, let me think about how to apply that but that's not really what he means he's talking about repeating this again and again because he really wants this in his mind very very clearly so he says give ear to the words O lord and consider my meditation he also wants god to give his attention to that to his meditation because he's there's something he's repeating over and over as he talks to god he says give heed to the voice of my cry and then Jim went over this passage with us back a few months ago when he was talking about the God, the Father, my King and my God. And he was looking at, at God, the Father. One of his titles in the Old Testament is that he was considered King of Israel. That was the way that he was looked. For to you, I will pray. So he says, listen, when I cry out to you, listen to me, God. Listen to me. Stop there for a second. Any comparison or contrast at this moment in time, just with those two verses. He's not our king. Okay. And, and we don't have to memorize the law. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking of a verse in Hebrews that says, Call on your name every day of trouble, and I will deliver you. Yeah. You and I, we have the privilege of being in the will of God, right? And when we're in the will of God, what can we do? Yeah. Yeah. So we can just talk to him. Yeah. The, the, the number one reasons Christians pray to God and we don't get what we want because it's not in God's will and we are not. We even touched on that this morning up there. Believers never go. For God to listen to us. Mm -hmm. 
but you don't have those things because all about you is One of the things that you come across the temple, they had a morning sacrifice. you're going to go to your job dude and if you're that people went up there and prayed at the temple. That's very different than you and I. You and I as believers, what does Paul tell us in 1 Thessalonians 5? Pray without ceasing. We're to be those that worship God and we never say, oh, I did my worship for the day, hang up, or I'll be back at three. <laughs> so those are some things to think about, some contrasts, and to put this in perspective. Verse, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning, I will direct it to you, and I will look up. Okay. Um, okay. I think what they're doing, probably when there's when they're translated that way, I'd have to go look it up. Oh, wait a second. This is my Hebrew Bible. I can look right in the margin. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I have the right. Sometimes these don't always line up. Yeah. I think this was. This is verse four here. I think this was their yeah. translation. This is this is uh, uh, to the Lord. He says here. Uh, so there's Jehovah Bokeh. If you want to take a little Hebrew, our Hebrew professor used to always say he would come in the morning, goes, Boker Tov. Goes, good morning. Tov is good. And Boker is uh is morning. So Boker Tov, listen to my voice. Yeah, listen to my voice in the morning. And then in Boker in the morning, I will arrange for you uh 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 atz, atzav, you know, something that I'm communicating towards you. But I think that they're they, I, they're making uh, range of the sacrifice. Yes, could be arranging as a sacrifice because again, that's kind of when they when they did this morning and evening as we're talking. I I just want to say I I misquoted that. I was thinking Hebrews thirteen five, um, where it says, "Make sure that your church is free for love of money." Blah 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 blah. For he himself has said, "I will never desert you nor will ever forsake you, so that you may be confident in the name of the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what man will do to me." That's mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have. I was listening to what you said, and I was like, "Okay, I, I know a passage, but I just I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gone to that one right away." So, thank you. Appreciate that. Verse four. He goes on in verse four and he says, uh, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. So this is kind of putting things together. First of all, saying you don't take pleasure in things that are evil. And he has two different words for evil. We have Rasha and then we have a Ra. 
Uh, and he says, and evil doesn't even dwell with you. It's not, it doesn't even, and the word that's translated dwell here is the word meaning to travel through, to be a sojourner. You're on a trip and you check into a hotel or you spend the night at a campground. He says, it doesn't even come and camp out for a little while with you. It doesn't even check in for an overnight stay is what he's getting at. Evil doesn't dwell with you, even in a transient way with you. <clears throat> and he's and he's looking at as he communicates, and you can see what he's looking at. In, in As he's crying out to God, obviously, David has some problems with some other people. And he has to remind himself, he says, you don't take pleasure in that. You don't look at evil men and go, oh, yeah, that brings me delight. God doesn't delight in seeing that. Verse 5, the boastful, they shall not stand in your sight. Again, probably what David is dealing with are people that are in opposition. And David, we, if you read through 2 Samuel and David's life, and you read through the account that we have over in 1 Chronicles, you can see that there were a lot of good things that David enjoyed in the kingdom, but David had some opposition. I mean, one of the thing, points of opposition that he had was, he had people that were like, who appointed you the king, David? You know, and it, it was kind of people that were connected with the tribe that the, that Saul had come from. And they were the ones that probably had the biggest problem thinking, well, it'd be love to have. We'd love to have another Benjamite in there. Uh, not who appointed you king. So David faced opposition. I think we if you haven't gone and read some of those things that Sit down and open your Bible over there, First Chronicles, and read through some of David, or read through Second Samuel, and see some of the challenges that David faced, because it tells us about David's reign that he he reigned for a number of years in Hebron. That's kind of where he had been living, and then spent the last part of his years in Jerusalem, because there was some conflict, and some of his reign for a while was actually only over part of Israel, because some of Israel didn't recognize his reign off the bat. See, so he's facing this, so he's looking at this issue of evil. And he says that there are people that are boastful, but they don't stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. And that word iniquity, which we've talked about is perversity. That by the way, is I think those are some of the verses you need to add when you talk about not God's attributes, but qualities that God expresses. And one of them is hate because everybody goes, God is love. God is love. God is love. He is love, but there are things God hates. And God hates sometimes people. And we don't like that because that makes God sound bad. But what he's doing is he's hating people that basically thumb their noses at him, or in this case are boastful and, and act perversity. He hates that. It doesn't just say that this is what I grew up hearing all the time. God loves this, uh, loves the sinner, but hates the sin. No, the Bible actually indicates God hates that sinner. And we never balance our teaching on the on the doctrine of God with the fact that there is hate. And some people go, well, God can't be pure love then. can't That can't be a real pure love. And by pure, it means just total love. It can't be a love of purity. It's a tainted love if he hates. Why? He wouldn't be just if he didn't have both. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't mete out justice. You don't have the ability to remove that love. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would agree. It probably makes that hates the sin by the verse that says there are six sins, a seven that the Lord hates, a lying kind, yeah. which would, you know, sort of be separated from a person, although it's not. Right. I don't know what the other things are. Lying tongue, no, I think is first. Right. Know. Yeah. Everybody knows, everybody could hear what Leslie was saying. She's saying that. There's the passage, and I think it's in Proverbs, but I could be wrong, that says there are seven things which God, or six things which God hates, seven, which are an abomination to him. And he goes goes through and he gives a list. But yeah, those are things God hates. But we have, and this is not the only passage that says that God hates wicked people, see? And he's perfectly righteous in doing so, and it doesn't conflict with his love. At the cross... John 3, 16 says, God loved, past tense the world, he sent his son. The act of sending the son was God's perfect act of love for the world. And yet the bulk of humanity, and I don't know, I'm going to throw out a number, 90%. I don't know that. Maybe it's 91. 
<laughs> but it's not a lot. The point is, Scripture is very clear. Most of humanity spurns God's love. And he doesn't retract it and say, well, my son didn't die for you then. No. What the son did still addressed their sins. And that was his act of love. And they say, are you a loving God? He goes, look what I did. I sent my son to do this. Would you give your son to rescue people that spurned you? Don't think so. Your enemies, yeah. Yeah, that would be Romans chapter 5. So I do think it's an important thing to balance this. Verse 6, you shall destroy those who speak, here in verse 6, falsehood, deceit. The Lord abhors, and he ties it right there, abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. And when he's talking here about this idea of bloodthirsty, I mean, obviously he's talking about that these people aren't just bad-mouthing you. These are people that would just as soon do what? They would just as soon kill you. They would just as soon kill you. And think about that in the history of the world. Think of how many, how many government changes have involved not a little bloodshed, but a lot of bloodshed. And maybe it isn't all immediate. When you look at, I, I don't know how many years ago it was, I read a, a book on um, somebody, that a family member that had been related to Stalin. And they were talking about, like, one of the worst places to be was to be a friend of Stalin's. <laughs> because there was a really good chance your life was going to be short. Because he was so paranoid. There were so many millions of people that he put to death in trying to protect his power like that. But that that goes on on large scales, small scales, but it goes on. It's kind of the history. And these people, obviously, by the fact that David says, I don't think he's speaking in hyperbole. I think David's indicating these people would just as soon slip my throat. Verse 7, but as for me, I will come into your house. What's that? The temple at this time it's the tent the tabernacle but yeah that's what we're talking about that's exactly what we're talking about the father's house uh uh by means of the multitude of your loving kindness in other words it's not that david he has he has had to he has had to earn the right because under the law you earned the right to approach god but he also is recognizing here in this expression by means of by means of god's multitude or his big we might say big loving kindness he says you are a lovingly kind god and even though david had to be ceremonially clean and all these other things to approach god he also is recognizing this is still we we would this isn't the word grace but there's a lot of times that kesed has passages that it comes closer to i think to our word our idea of grace than the hebrew word ken which is favor or grace in the Old Testament does. This is my opinion on this. So you can go do a word study, find out this word and click on, you know, in your English, click on look up keynote or key keyword, whatever it is, the number, and it'll show you all the places where that word's translated because it's translated a lot of different places. My Bible translates it mercy here. It's not mercy. It's dependable, faithful, loving kindness. Is the idea behind this word. In fear of you, I will worship, notice, toward your holy temple. This is one of the things, just as a kind of an aside, that I, I hope to work on this as a study sometimes. But we have that statement, you know, in 1 Timothy, where he says, I, I, I encourage that men, he's talking to males, lift up holy hands without disputing and fighting. And, and so in churches today, you get... Uh, in fact, we were talking with friends last weekend, or oh, we were talking with the guys, and they were here about Tim Hawkins, if you've ever seen him. He's a comedian that's supposed to be a Christian. He talks about all the, you know, the ways that you raise hands to the fluttering birds, you know, there's the launch pads, there's all these different things, the way that people raise hands. Whatever is going on, as I've gone through and looked at some of these passages, and you have to kind of know how to look for it, because they're not, they don't all use this exact same language. But it always seems to be that it has to do with when they're praying, they're pointing, saying, you're there. You're there. You're in that temple. Or there's sometimes that they're praying and they recognize like Solomon does. We pray towards the temple, but you're actually in heaven and you're answering there. And so sometimes they point towards heaven. But it seems like what they're doing is it's a way of physically, because a big part of Old Testament worship involved physical, physical uh, posture. 
prostrating yourself on the ground or raising your hands towards heaven or towards the object of the, the place you're worshiping. And he says, in this place, he says, then I will, um, in fear then, I will worship toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. In other words, I, so here's a question. When you have problems, you have conflicts and people are treating you bad, is it easy for you to kind of overreact and act as bad or kind of like them sometimes? Yeah. I never have that problem, but I'm just wondering if you guys did. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when it, when I'm not treated real well, it's real easy to say, oh, yeah, well, fine. You know, and and I think so David's saying, no, lead me in your righteousness because I've got I have these enemies and I don't want to I don't want to be like these people. I want to know what your righteous way is. I want to know that every point of this way and make your way straight before me. And as he's looking at that word straight, which I think we've talked about in different contexts before, this word just share as the idea of like straight or smooth. It's not a, it's not a, it's it's a contrast between like a really, it's a contrast between this street out here <laughs> and Royal Road that rolls into town. That one's smooth asphalt. This one's like, <laughs> there's days you feel like you're in the mountains, you know. I've driven on mountain roads. This is not that bad, but you sure feel like it when your street used to be semi-smooth. Anyway. But that's the idea. Make the road smooth or straight before, he says, before my face. In other words, what he's really asking is, I want it to be straight. I want it to be what it's supposed to be. But he's actually asking God for some benefits, some ease. Why, why would David ask for something to be comfortable or easy? Think of, think of this in the larger context of the Old Testament. I kind of even touched on this this morning. Getting old. <laughs> well, there is that. There is that. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. And Gary said because he's getting old. <laughs> Which is true. No, I didn't say you were. I say David was. David was. I knew what you meant. I knew what you meant. He's referring to David. But my my wife will tell you, I mean, there was a time. We used to go out and tromp. We used to tromp in the mountains and we tromp on trails like this. I sorry to pick on her for doing this, but as her eyesight has declined, we don't do those trails anymore because it's like trails. You think, oh, this used to be nothing. Now you're like, man, there's tons of tree roots sticking out of the trail and chunky rocks. And if you can't see where you're going down there, I mean, how fun is a hike when you have to spend the whole time doing this? There's another rock. There's another thing. You can't look up in a... <laughs> and knee pads and, yeah i mean it, it think, things do change and things do get hard but there's <laughs> there, there's another aspect of all of this though that i think and this reflects what we were talking about this morning under the law if you obeyed you got blessed, you got blessed. and that blessing really was good yeah. health Good yeah. crops, wealth, and he, 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 he was helping him with the whole country. Uh, his his being blessed is going to have an effect on everybody. Yeah, Whether they attribute it to God. It would. It would. So let's let me ask you: Is there also a contrast there with regard to you and I? We don't have that promise. We don't. Have it, I'm not asking for anybody to admit this or raise hands. I just want you to think about this. Have you ever asked, have you ever found yourself asking God, can, can it just be easier for a while? Can it just go a little bit more? My wife's research. <laughs> What'd you say? On a daily, On a daily basis. Yeah. This time. Tape. Oh, yeah, just yeah, tape. Yeah. 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 But we don't have. We don't have a promise for God, but this was something as an Old Testament saint that he can honestly ask for. And, and if his conduct was in keeping with what the law said, God could make a straight way for him. For us, no. In fact, uh, this was a this was a a question that Peg and I both ended up talking to a, to an individual uh, yesterday at the, after the conference, and that is. Um, can't you reach a point in which you don't really have to be tempted that much? That temptation starts to decline. It starts to go away, you know? 
And both of us were like, no, because facing temptation and facing difficult things is very clear in the New Testament. That's one of the ways God grows us. He grows us by us facing hard challenges. That's not the answer that everybody wants. But to tell them otherwise is going to mislead believers, isn't it? But if we just come to the Old Testament, we ought to be able to think, well, if something bad's happened to me. I must have done something bad, you know? If I want something, I want things to go well, I better start being good. And then we start being good and we go, how come everything isn't going well? How come it's still so hard? because we're not under the law and we have a different set of promises. Verse nine, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. That is the mouth of these, this opposition. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb and they flatter with their tongues. I don't know. I think most of you probably understand the, the idea of an open tomb um, as a kid, because I didn't know, I didn't, we didn't have tombs where I grew up. We just had graves I used to, when we'd read things, I always thought about like the danger of walking in the dark through a cemetery and a grave would be open and falling in. But that's not really what he's talking about so much. He's talking about a tomb or a grave, but it's open and it smells. It stinks. If you guys, we all know death stinks. I mean, literally, as well as emotionally and everything else. That for us. Graves that have been used before? Yes. Yes, which is frequently why why people would be put in tombs and then frequently they would, you know, they what they have with, with Jesus, would they take a hundred pounds, a hundred pounds of herbs and such that they would, and spices and all that, that they would dress the body with to try to control the smell. Yeah. I just saw a picture of what was it? Catacomb somewhere in your church in Europe. But literally a like a wall of skulls and bones. Mm -hmm. And they had, I mean, everybody was buried under this church, buried under this church. Well, they weren't all buried in that wall like those bones were. Yeah. So they had to like periodically go down there and mm -hmm. pick out the bones that were done being yeah, domesticated and put them into this wall. Absolutely, it was, it was just it was something I never thought about, but it was just like, wow. I mean, that's no wonder he's in such a church. That's one of the that's one of the reasons when you have the 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 account of Jesus's burial, it says that they laid him in a tomb in which no man had been laid. Because oftentimes, if you went to the work of digging, having a tube card out for you, that was going to be a family tomb. And you might have multiple generations that are buried in there, but they're not all buried stretched out. They're doing exactly what you said. Yeah. And so that meant you had to go in and there is a smell of death even after a long time. It still has a, can have a, uh, yeah. And then New Orleans, they have these tin boxes. And they belong to a family, and they put the dead person on the top thing. And if and there's there's really day. in their median heat, if it's right, they can be completely decomposed in 30 days. And you push them back and they fall. And so they just shut wow. in and go to a little the hole at the back, and, and the ashes go there, and then they put the next one. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, see, we're, we just have such a sanitary culture all away from that that we don't always appreciate what, you know, what people have had to do. Pardon me? Yeah, kind of, you know, our wind area was owned by the French. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. But he says at the end of verse nine, so he says, this is what these people are and they flatter with their tongue. So in other words, when he says, they, he says that, they, that their throat is an open tomb, obviously what he's saying is the things they say, they make it sound good. There's flattery, there's all this stuff, but it's, it's got the stink that you know none of it's right. You know? Uh, yeah. What? 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 The state of the union. No. Well, and I was going to use that as an example. Because what is this? This these are people that are opposing David as king. And just think about it. We we 
we have two we have two people vying well we have a whole bunch of people vying for the office of king in our country oh no it's president here i'm sorry mm -hmm. but off and 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 what do they do they they badmouth their throats are open are open graves and it stinks you listen you listen to the stuff that they say even if there's even if it's the guy you like sometimes you're like oh man that just that stinks you know what you said that was a little overboard at times right we get that so yeah that, that was a really good example that was the one that kind of came to mind but verse 10 pronounce them guilty O lord or god excuse me let them fall by their own counsels in other words, I think, and we all know that sometimes you have people that set out to do plans. We always want to intervene, but sometimes it's like, no, let's just sit back and let's see what happens here. Cause you kind of, you've been down this path, you know, this isn't going to end well. So let's just see them submarine their own project. And so he says, there's no faithful, oh, excuse me, wrong verse, pronounce them guilty. Oh, let, let them fall by their own counsels, cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, transgressions because they are under under the law, for they have rebelled against you. How had these people rebelled against God? Think about this. Well, right off the top, because they didn't accept him as king. He was appointed by God. And they should have known that. Yeah. God sent Samuel to anoint David. Nobody was privy to that except Samuel and David's family. But it was made clear to the nation that David was the one. When David actually took the throne, I mean, and they, they if, even if they would have looked at David's reputation, David had multiple opportunities that he could have slit Saul's throat, could have done Saul in, but he didn't overthrow him. And I had a friend once that thought, what? David was God's anointed. He should have just done Saul in. I still look at it and I think, you know, I think David was wise because he says, he I always said, I won't. Touch the Lord's so even though he was anointed, he considered Saul anointed. Yeah, too, and took yeah. He still, he still wanted, he wanted it to be in God's timing. And I think David, I, I personally think David was wise in that. Uh, like I said, my, my friend uh, would disagree with me on that. But let them fall by their own counsels. Verse eleven. But let those who rejoice, who put, or let all those rejoice who put their trust you let them ever shout for joy because you defend them not because they're great not because they're powerful how many times when you go through the old testament and you read about enemies that come against israel there are times that israel has to go out they have to have spear and sword and shield and all that and they actually have to do battle but we have a number of accounts where the people do exactly what god wants and god's the one that does all the routing He's the one that causes, he, there, there's one time when the people come in from two di different directions and God so addles them by the noise that they end up, the enemies kill each other. And Israel just stands back and watch what God does. So he defends. And David, who could have defended himself, could have done these things, could have fought. Could have. I mean, I mean, we do know he was a man of war. So it's not like he's, he never did these kind of things, but he actually learned what it was that God would defend him. But let me ask a question now again in verse 11. Do you have a promise that if somebody attacks you, if somebody opposes you, that they're going to fail in opposing you or fail in trying to do you maybe physical harm? In fact, um, um, second, <clears throat> excuse me, second, yeah, exactly. They do, in fact, they in second, what because they hate us, yeah, <laughs> second Timothy, second Timothy chapter four, I believe it's verse 17 and 18 down there, where, where Paul says, You know, nobody stood with me at my first defense. <laughs> he says, Don't let that be helpful, those guys. He said, but the Lord stood with me, strengthened me. And he says, and I didn't get thrown to the lions. And then he takes that same word, rescue. And he says, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. When that Roman soldier's sword comes down on Paul's neck and severs his head from his body, Paul's like, 
Nobody's ever going to do another evil thing to me ever. And the Lord, he says, and he will rescue me into his heavenly kingdom. It's not the kingdom of heaven's word that Jesus uses. It's a kingdom that has an association with heavens. Think about that. Your brothers and sisters in Christ that aren't with us anymore, that have gone home. And I can think of people from our assembly over the years that have gone home. And then people that we've prayed for from other places. And you know, believers, they're up there. They're not just sitting up there stretching out on a chase lounge, eating grapes and waiting for us to get here. Man, it's been 2000 years. God, when, when are we, when are we getting on with the program? One of my uncles, I maybe I shared this with you, but one of my uncles was talking to me about this because I, uh, with my dad's death, Paul te or Peter tells us that a, a day with the Lord is, or a thousand years is like a day with the Lord. And, and David says in the Psalms, a thousand years is like a watch in the night, about three or four hours. So one way or another, we could quibble. Oh, well, well who's right? Oh, both of them are trying to say the same thing. A thousand years of God isn't much. It's a day. It's a few hours. It's not very long. And for those believers that are up there that have that have already gone up there before the Father, that are up before before the Lord Jesus Christ, excuse me, and they're up there in that heavenly kingdom, the things that are going on for them in that place for us today. It's, it's, I think by the time they come back, it's like, we just got here. We've just had enough time to kind of run around and say hi to maybe some other believers that we've known before. My uncle was saying, my uncle Glenn, he passed away just a handful of years. My dad walks in and Glenn's like, Roger, wow, I didn't know you were coming so soon. I got here just a few minutes ago, you know, think about that. My grandparents, you know, just, just a little bit, just a little bit. Stephen, talk, Peg, Peg and I were talking about this either Friday night or yesterday morning. Peg's mom, you know, maybe she was up there and going, Roger, hey, you know, and they're all up there. And I don't know what they're doing in that kingdom. There's some activity in that kingdom, but they're up there. See, like this. And they're waiting. And they are those that the Lord has defended them, even defending them to the point of saying, hey, I'm going to bring you home. I'm going to let these, I'm going to let these really horrible, evil people kill you but you're going to come home and not a one of them is going to get up there and go, Hey, I want to go back. This is not that great. Paul said, it is much better. He writes that to the Philippians. It's much better. He writes in second Corinthians. I heard things you can't even talk about down here. It's like, it really is better. It just, it's different. And it's hard for us to wrap our minds around the fact that there's something that actually could be better than this life. We always want to be, we're, we're, we're like Gordon. We'd like a day when the when it's nice, the breeze is just right, and we can be on a float boat on the Yakima, Yakima River fishing, not having to float cement or something like that. Just have it, you know, that's what we'd like heaven to be. But it's better than that. It's better than the best day we could ever have on earth. Even in the state of death, it's better than this. Better, not just better. Paul says very much better. That's an important thing for us to think about and wrap our minds around. But that's contrast. David doesn't say it here, but David looks at a defense as keeping him alive. Because we read elsewhere and we find out David wasn't too keen on the idea of dying. It's not a thing that he really relished. He didn't really want to die. Because for them, it was going to Sheol. And in some way, going to Sheol, their their perspective of Sheol was that it was a place that was dark. And in fact, yeah, even Isaiah says, you know, in Sheol, who praises you in Sheol? Now, I don't know, is, is, was, was Isaiah right? Or was that just the Old Testament believer's perspective? But again, you're trying to, we need to change our perspective that the perspective of an Old Testament saint versus a New Testament saint with regard to death is different. It's different. Paul says that when Christ died and rose again, he took the power from Satan over death so that you and I no longer have to be enslaved by means of fear. So he goes on, the last half of verse 11. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. So these other people, obviously, by contrast to what Paul said, or what Paul, what David is saying, they don't put their trust in the Lord and they don't love his name. David did. I mean, look at how many Psalms David writes in which he talks about God and talks about the good things that God. In fact, right even here, 
he says, you defend us. You defend us. You're the one that defends us. And he's talking about, like I said, a physical defense. And we'll shout for joy. But verse 12, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. This is very much, uh, this is very much the same that you had when we looked at Psalm chapter one, where he uh, said over there that happy is the, the righteous man. It's like a strong tree that's planted next to a stream and it's got all that those resources. He says, let those who love your name be joyful. Oh, sorry, verse 12. I, I the end of verse 11 up there. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. There's that, that uh, word that we, we were talking about a little while ago that's not really, doesn't really communicate the idea of much. But your favor will, you will surround him. So in other words, again, I really think he's looking at physical deliverance in this. You're going to around or surround him with um, one of the other words that's, that he that he uses here um, for this. I'm just trying to look at it, uh, try to get my my foundation. Oh yeah, right there. That surrounding uh, with your favor. There, that's it. I was thinking. I was looking over here and I wasn't finding the word grace. It's not the word. It's not the word can. It's pleasing things. You're going to surround him with pleasing things like a shield. Again, this is part of the life of an Old Testament saint. They were obeying, they were righteous, doing these things. They have these things that God puts around them. And they're pleasing things. It's like, oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. And oh, I like that. Last night, Peg and I started watching. I'll go home and have to do this. St. Patrick's Day. Get on YouTube, pull up Quiet Man. <laughs> you have to watch a few commercials in it. All of you ever watched The Quiet Man? Haven't watched The Quiet Man? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, we're leaving Peg. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's it's an it's it's John Wayne, and he yeah. and it's I I don't want to spoil it. And Marino here, and he, and he goes back to Ireland to buy this his ancestral home back there. But when he when he marries Marino Hera, she it's a big thing that the woman comes with her dowry, and she goes, I want to be surrounded by my things with my spinet over there in my chairs and all this and. <laughs> we've watched this movie for years it's our it's our we have to finish it tonight because both of us zonked out last night <laughs> didn't finish it last night but it, i think about that pleasing things how many of you kind of like to go to your home and you look around and you're like i like my chairs i like my table i like it's like somebody else might come in and go this is your stuff and you're like i like my stuff you know you go to other people's i don't want to sit in any of their stuff because it's too fancy for me or something like that it's home. It's home. Yeah. And he surrounds them with these pleasing things like it's a, like they're a shield. Very interesting thing. For you and I as believers, I don't know. I would say the closest we come to this. I mean, does God let us enjoy nice things in life? Yeah. Hasn't promised them. I don't think there's a one of us in here that says right now we are in any way deprived of nice things. We're kind of different than a lot of believers in the history of the church. But I'd say the real things that are good is the things that God surrounds us with that we have in Christ, where he says, you are righteous and you're a priest and you have a spiritual gift. Things that can never be taken away. Yeah, yeah. They can come and take all my furniture, burn down my house, kick me out on the street, but they cannot take away who I am in Christ. I'm always going to be one seated at the Father's right hand. And even if they take me away and put me in a, I watched a movie many years ago about, about three pastors from Russia that were taken and put in a gulag in Siberia, and their wives were allowed to come and visit them one day a year through the fence. They had to talk. That's all they could do one day a year. And those three pastors did that. If they took me away and I never got to see my wife except one day a year, and I didn't get to see you anymore. I am still always seated with you at the Father's right hand. Please. God giving favor to all that and saying, but without a promise of that. Now Job uh, said, said that you've surrounded him with a hedge, indicating special favor, um, and take that hedge away and watch him curse your names. And God doesn't discount, he doesn't argue the point. If, he, if he'd given the promise, God would have been unrighteous to remove that hedge because Job is still righteous through that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But God gave him that hedge. And he took that away, so it wasn't a promise, but he still granted that favor to Job. 
How to write that down? That's that's a good example. I'm writing this down, Jim. Thank you. Appreciate that one, Jim. Anybody else have any thoughts? So I, I, I guess one of the things that hopefully this is an encouragement for you is that wherever you're studying the Bible, wherever you're reading, come to it and say, what what's here? What does it say? What's it say in its context? And hopefully look at it and say, okay, this is a guy. He's not living today like I am and in the same situation I am. But he did have some sort of a relationship with God. And what does he reflect in that relationship with God, number one? And what are some things that maybe bear some similarities, as we said at the beginning? But what are some things that maybe are different? And pay attention to those, too. I think that that's a, a good way always to study. Maybe there aren't. Maybe you don't see anything obviously different. But it's not a bad way to, to read uh, those passages of Scripture that you probably know aren't directly about you and your conduct and relationship to God today. And it, again, shows you that there is some value in reading these passages because Paul tells us all Scripture is profitable or valuable. It's just not always valuable in the same way. So, okay, well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful then for the afternoon and for the kind attention and participation of these saints here as we think through these this concern this prayer that david has as he's looking at this opposition and we face opposition and sometimes when we're facing that we will cry out to you uh, but you haven't promised us to respond in the same way that you did to david we need to understand what you have promised us and rather than confusing those things so we're thankful god for your faithfulness to david and we're thankful for your faithfulness to us and to the promises that you made to us as New Testament believers. Thank you again for the day and whatever you have in store for us today and in the remainder of this week that we might do so, uh, appreciating your grace to us in Christ. And we thank you for it. Amen.